Hi, this is Richard Watts. I'm the director of the Center for Research on Vermont. And today, as part of the College of Arts and Sciences Experts Live and the Center for Research on Vermont Research Wednesdays, we're going to have a special conversation with Dr. Stephanie Seguino. Stephanie is a professor of economics at the University of Vermont. And she examines the impacts of economic inequality, race, class, and gender on the economy. So welcome, Stephanie, to our Experts Live Wednesday presentation. Today, our topic is a study that Stephanie did on driving while black and brown in Vermont. Welcome, Dr. Seguino. Thanks. Thanks. So we're going to talk about racial disparities in policing in Vermont at a study that Stephanie completed with Dr. Nancy Brooks. And then we'll have a broader conversation about institutional racism and this moment that's happening around the country. But I thought we'd start by talking about your study and the research that you did in Vermont. So perhaps give us the, I know it's based on something like half a million traffic stops, but maybe give us the outlines. Sure. Let me just say that this work started a number of years ago, actually 2008, I think it was, uh, in which a group called Uncommon Alliance was formed uh, in the Burlington area. And it was because of repeated incidents of racial profiling by the police, uh, at least uh, from the perspective of people of color in the community. And so at a certain point, you know, the police agreed to meet with um, the community of color and hence the Uncommon Alliance, and they met monthly. The problem was that people would come in and they'd tell a story about an event that they felt was racially biased, and the police would say, well, you know, maybe it's explained by this or this. And it never was successful in being more than an anecdote. And so the agreement was reached that the police would collect data. They would collect data on the date, time, and place of the stop, the age, gender, and race of the person stopped, the reason for the stop, uh, whether or not there was a search of the vehicle, whether or not contraband was found if there was a search, and what the outcome of the stop was. Was it a ticket? Was it a warning? Was it an arrest? And uh, I think maybe because that earlier study showed racial disparities in, in uh, the Chittenden County area, the legislature was moved to require that all law enforcement agencies collect these data. So our 2017 study was the first, and to my knowledge, the only analysis of that data. And uh, what we found, and that we called it driving while black and brown in Vermont because we wanted people to understand what is the experience of people of color driving in Vermont? What is their experience with regard to policing? Does it differ? Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, quite substantially. We found that in most agencies, uh, the bias was anti-black bias and to a slightly lesser extent, anti-Hispanic bias, uh, but not necessarily anti-Asian bias. And in fact, what we found it was particularly of blacks and Hispanics that were overstopped relative to their share of the driving population, right? If, if you know, let's say blacks are 5% of the drivers in Burlington, we'd expect them to be 5% of the stops. We have no reason to believe they're worse drivers or better drivers, right? So we looked at stops, but that's not the only thing that you can look at. You also can look at uh, uh, what happens at the end of a stop are people of color more likely to get a ticket than a warning as compared to white drivers. Uh, so are they treat, treated more harshly? Uh, are they more likely to be searched? Is their vehicle more likely to be searched than white drivers? And how frequent is it that you actually find contraband? And that's actually a critical measure of racial bias is if there is a, a, a higher search rate of people of color, but a lower what we call hit rate. That is the percentage of searches that results in contraband is actually lower than for whites. So here's what we found in Vermont, that uh, almost all agencies were overstopping black 
drivers, and almost all agencies were understopping Asian drivers, right? So you groups are treated differently. And the, the bias that we observe in this country, in Minnesota, in, uh, in, in you know, Charlotte, North Carolina, wherever else in this country is typically the greatest bias is anti-black bias, especially by the police. And so we found that blacks were twice as likely to be arrested as white drivers subsequent to a stop. So why is that? What explains that? Uh, often it's suspicion. So for example, if you're stopped by the police and they, you know, they charge you with something, if they believe you're a flight risk, they might take you back to the station and book you. Whereas somebody that they don't believe is a flight, flight risk, they'll just give them a ticket. And so racial bias plays a role in that, right? There's more mistrust of, of African Americans. There's more belief that they're outsiders and so forth. So that could explain the arrest rate disparity, but truly I haven't seen a good explanation for it yet uh, that would legitimize the disparity. So we also find that black drivers are 365% uh, more likely to be searched than white drivers in Vermont and Hispanics 260%. Uh, Asian drivers are half as likely to be searched as white drivers. So again, we see uh, in practice what we, what we read in critical race theory that the darker your skin, that is their colorism and the more pathologized the darker your skin tone. And we treat Asians almost as honorary white, right? Um, we also found that the percentage of hit of cases searches that resulted in contraband was very low for blacks relative to whites. So clearly there is over searching of blacks or there's under searching of white drivers. Um, and we did a, an analysis on the side that after the 2017 study in which we asked Vermont State Police for information on contraband, because what police officers would tell me is, is that they believe it was black and brown drivers bringing drugs into Vermont. And so they were always, they, you know, they were typically searching for drugs. So we wanted to find out if that's true or not. And the, the, they are not required to give us data on what the contraband is. But Vermont State Police was very generous at the time. And they went through all of the searches of 2016 uh, or in all those cases in which contraband was found. To me, what was really startling about that was that of all of the searches that resulted in hard drugs, so uh, cocaine, heroin, and opioids, 100% of the drivers were white. Not a single driver of color was found with those drugs. So for me, that's an example of a stereotype that is not consistent with reality, at least in terms of random drug searches on the highway. Um, and finally, one thing that we found was when we, some, uh, okay, this is a little bit humorous, but uh, when the legislation came out, towns were not, required to give us information on office officer level data but some of them did uh they no longer do that but uh it, it we looked at the data for individual agencies and what we found is there's it's not like there's a bad apple in most of these agencies the overwhelming number of officers were overstopping black drivers so i think it's a cultural issue it's you know one could argue in the case of George Floyd that the offending officer was just a bad apple but uh, the reality is there's a culture around this and the culture of leadership in the department matters. And it's, we have to recognize that we all have these biases. We have been trained, we've been socialized to associate African-American men with threat and criminality. And the sad fact is that they are profoundly, they live in fear of whites. They live in fear of whites. And uh, we have it just backwards. And the reality is that we all have it, and it shows up in it shows up in the Vermont data just as it shows up all over the country. I remember. Um, so we're talking with Stephanie Seguino, professor of economics, about a study on racial disparity. People are welcome to post comments or questions about this or the broader issues of racial institutional racism that we see around us in this country. So on the study, I remember when it came out, and there was. A, a lot of news and attention brought to it, Stephanie. And I'm wondering, Vermont has this sort of scattered police system, right? We have a state police, right? 
probably manages and is the more professional arm, but then there are, I don't know, dozens and dozens of local police forces. So what, what was the reaction when you brought this forward in a public way? And I know you made an effort also to meet individuals or, you know, to go out and talk to people about it. Yeah. I, I mean, I presented at a number of police departments, uh, some towns invited me to speak to their select boards about it. Uh, in advance, I had shared the data with police chiefs um, so that they wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be a surprise to them. The reaction really was um, pushback. I think there was a polite, thank you very much at the time, but they, there was, uh, I would say a backlash, uh, trying to deny the results, to say we're not racist, we don't have a problem. Uh, all of this is justified. You didn't you didn't sufficiently take into consideration um, context. And then, really, mostly what has happened is that police departments don't even use the data. They're not they're not even looking at the data. The data is really meant for them to be a tool to to look at the data and say, "Wow, we have these disparities. Let's sit down and talk about why that is. What could be causing that? You know, maybe sometimes those disparities are justified." But maybe they're not. But if you don't use the data to give you that feedback, there, you know, what's what's the sense of doing it? And how can you get better at this if you're not using the data? And so, um, in many ways, I would say 99% of police departments don't even use the data. I know of two that do. Amazing. Uh, maybe three. Uh, maybe three. Amazing, because. You collected so much, so many data points. I mean, people have poked at your study from a variety of places, but one was to, but you have, as an economics expert, you actually have broad enough statistics that can actually say things about what's happening, even at the town level, is that right? Yeah, so we had, a, there were half a million traffic stops, and just to be clear, this is data that the police departments generate, right? So it's their data. Um, and. Uh, so we, so some towns were too small to be able to say anything with statistical reliability. So Heinsberg comes to mind, right? I think they had 500 stops. And so when you think of, you know, our racial proportions in the state, that wasn't really enough to say anything on a lot of the indicators, but the, there were larger towns like Rutland, Burlington, Will Williston and South Burlington, for example. And we're in the process now of analyzing data through 2018. So many of those towns that were too small then to say anything about statistically, we can now do that. But yeah, we, you know, certainly there were statewide, the sample size was large enough and it was large enough for certain towns. And, and just the findings so clearly show this, not, I don't know if you use the word implicit, actual bias because black and brown drivers were stopped at three to four times the rates, searched at much higher rates, and then, as you said, much actually much likely, much less likely to actually have any contraband. Right, right. So, you know, it's consistent with the stories that people tell me because, you know, especially after the study, before that, but especially after the study, people call me and tell me about their experience with the police. And you know, you know, especially people of color, it, it, it's consistent with the data. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I, it brings it home so tragically. These stops can end up in absolute awful circumstances for people of color, black and brown drivers. So talk, just talk about that a little bit. So it's not just some number that you're more likely to get stopped it's the ramifications of getting stopped yeah and I, i'm not sure that many people understand how traumatizing um this is you know i mean when a person of color uh sees a a, a blue light in the back they are already in a, they are in a panic situation because they now fear for their lives right so in one case uh that I got a phone call was from a woman who's African-American and worked for the Department of Human Services. She was stopped by the state police. She actually, um, she actually had, I think her badge was in the car and the police chief, uh, the police officer, the trooper stopped her um, and said that she was 
I don't know, following the car in front of her too closely. This is what we call a pretextual stop, you know, in that they find some reason to stop you. And believe me, if any police follow you for an hour, a mile, they'll find some, you know, some reason to stop you. And so he then said she looked nervous. Uh, and then he said he went and got a dog and, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, said he wanted to search the car. And so she said, okay, and, you know, you just for listeners, just so that you know, you do not have to say yes. Uh, you can say no. And, and that would force the officer to uh, go to a judge and get a warrant. So in any case, she said, sure. And he searched the car and as soon as he saw his badge, he said, okay, thank you very much and went on his way. But that was, that was two hours, two, two and a half hours. Um, she told me she was going to leave Vermont, you know, and I've heard this from numerous people uh, who it is just very, it's, it's humiliating, it's traumatizing, they lose time from work, uh, and they're scarred by this. And, and the worst part of this is that uh, we don't actually, you know, it, it hurts policing because you need community members to trust the police to be able to report things and so on and so forth, and that doesn't happen. Uh, it, you know, if, if people don't trust the police. I think there was actually a police chief on last night uh, on a video in Bellevue, Washington, a white guy, a really, you know, thoughtful around race. And he said when he got the job, he said, uh, so the mayor, he said, you know, you're not going to like this, but if I do my job well, crime crime calls are going to rise. Calls, calls with, you know, complaints about crime are going to rise. And the mayor said, why is that? He said, because I will build relationships with the community of color and they will feel safe calling us and reporting crimes that they otherwise wouldn't. So I think that's what we've sacrificed if we don't address this issue. We have one question here, Stephanie. Um, as citizens, how do we start the conversation with our police officers about how they might actually use this data that you collected and analyzed? Well, that's a really great question. And I think Williston is a great example because their, their numbers are elevated in terms of racial disparities. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know the structure in Burlington, but in, I'm sorry, in Williston, but Burlington as a police commission, I don't know what the mechanisms are, but I think you want to talk to your mayor and select board and ask them to have a presentation on this issue. And then, uh, you know, I would say develop a, a citizen oversight group uh, or a mechanism for the entities outside of the police department getting these data and then saying to the police chief, what are you going to do? Present us a plan for reducing these disparities. And then let's track your progress over time. And let's have your job evaluation depend upon how well you've done in addressing these racial disparities. I, community groups are the only ones that are gonna hold these law enforcement agencies accountable because in Vermont, the only state level entity we have is the, I think, um, Commissioner of Public Safety, which only oversees the Vermont State Police. So yeah. there is no entity outside of the towns that is overseeing um, the, the uh, individual towns. So I would say, you know, ask them for their data, demand that there be a monthly report of the data that is put on the city's website and look at the data and engage them in meetings at city council or whatever the public meetings are. And, you know, that, that to me would be really powerful. You had some other recommendations um, just about the collection, the ongoing collection of this, how it's organized, some, uh, any other suggestions like that that you had yeah, I mean, so this is kind of policy stuff, especially for legislators, you know, that there's data that we could get that would answer some questions that people have. So oftentimes, for example, the police will say, oh, well, it was an out-of-state driver. It's, it's not clear to me why that would explain away the racial disparities, but that would be good if we had data on which, which drivers were from out-of-state and which drivers weren't from out-of-state. Um, we would love data on what the contraband is. Uh, I think it would be important for the public to have officer level data anonymized, but it, so we can see what is the pattern of behavior within agencies, for example. Uh, so we made numerous recommendations. One of the biggest deficiencies I see is that there is no statewide report. There's no ownership of this. And in other states, the attorney general will uh, collect the data and report it on a website. Missouri does this. 
North Carolina has a website where anybody can look at the data for any city or town. Uh, and so we, and, and the data in Vermont is not very good because people don't code the data the same way. Uh, it's very, we, we spend 15 hours trying to analyze the data because it's so disorganized. And if you really want it to be a tool, then the state really needs to take ownership of it and, and analyze it and uh, clean the data so that it's useful to agencies and useful to the public. I, for me, one of the striking things about your study on racial disparities in policing was that Vermont actually did less well than some other places in the country. And we always pride ourselves on being so thoughtful and progressive and, I don't know, immune to some of this. And yet this clearly indicates that we're as bad or worse. I mean, I think that's the, you know, I found that that's the biggest impediment uh, in any of the work that I've done on racial equality in Vermont has been the, um, A, the defensiveness of white people here about what you called me a racist when you know you're not calling them a racist and their belief in their liber liberalism so they are unwilling or unable to scrutinize their own actions i mean i'll give you an example here from burlington recently on the school board um, which we have an african-american um, i should say a black superintendent and an all-white uh, board that uh, uh, when he recommended five principles to be hired in the spring. Two of them were black and three were white. The school board approved all of the white principal nominations and turned down the black nominations. And every time that happens, you know, so, and, and I think they believe that they're good people, but you have to be willing to look at your behavior. And, uh, you know, even the, the person who's the current chair of the school board, um, prior to getting on the school board, would often criticize the school district, but she only criticized black administrators. And, and, you know, for me as a person that does this work, that's very glaring. And then the question is, how do you get people, how can you help sensitize people and become aware of what I think are unconscious biases, right? But, you know, this moment in history is telling us that it's time for white people to step up and, uh, and, not put this work on the shoulder of people of color to always be saying that we can't take it anymore. None of us should be able to take this anymore. We are all diminished by this. And so, you know, I really hope that white Vermonters um, address their white fragility and join the game because they think their values of Vermonters are really admirable, but they, they have a blind spot when it comes to the issue of race. All right, to end. Thank you for that. And maybe let's just pause for a moment and talk about what's going on in the country, and then I'll come back to some of the specific questions people have about your study. But oh, we, um, you know, peaceful protests around the country. Um, the death of George Floyd has brought so much attention to this. What are you thinking, Stephanie, as you watch all this unfold? Oh, that's very, very hard. Um, I think the you know the utter pain of watching somebody murdered on video by one of our most important public institutions was a defining moment for us. Uh, even with the it, you know so even with the videos in the past several years, um, um, it's given people insight into policing and the disparate treat, treatment of especially men of color. But even with those videos where people were often able to say, well, maybe something happened just before the video went on or, you know, all of these other things. And I think that this video uh, maybe uh, opens to people's eyes, but I think the most significant thing about this moment is, um, I think two significant things. The fact that thankfully, people, especially people of color, but white people too have stood up and said, this cannot happen anymore. That this has been the last straw for us. Uh, but the other thing that's different this time, I have never seen police hold each other accountable. And we now see statements from the Vermont State Police, for example, from other police departments, police chiefs all over the country saying, this is not, this is not right. And they are condemning this officer as a murderer. 
Uh, that has never happened in the past. There have always been, you know, well, we need to investigate. Uh, there might have been other factors. The ability, and I think what's happened here is that many police probably already thought this, but the club culture, you know, the frat culture of police departments is such that you, you're so afraid to disrupt your relationship with the group that you sometimes don't speak up. And now for some reasons, police now feel that it's okay to speak up and I'm hoping they will continue to speak up in the future. I mean, it, you know, we, we have our own cases in Vermont uh, and I'm hoping that, you know, police, you know, departments in Vermont will now begin to speak up and hold each other accountable. So staying with Vermont and your research, um, somebody asked what departments did respond to your study? What, who, who, what towns may have stepped up to look at it and what did they actually do differently going forward? Yeah. Well, let me, you know, so I think there's, let me say, I think there's like maybe actually four that kind of use the data, but two that really use it. So I'll just talk about the two that really use it, which is, um, Vermont State Police and Brattleboro Police. And what they do is they, they look at the data, they look at the officer level data. And if there's an officer who's, let's say, you know, 30% of their car stops are drivers of color, when drivers of color are only 10% of the population, they see that there's this disparity and they call the officer in. And they say, let's talk about it. Let's talk about how you're policing, uh, and so on and so forth. And in, in Brattleboro, they do this routinely. Um, it's part of the evaluation. And actually at Vermont State Police too, there are people who are evaluated on this. The commanders are evaluated on the degree to which they are promoting bias-free policing. So that's really the way to look at the data, you know, use the data is to download it every month. It doesn't take much to analyze it. And, and talk about it, talk about what's going on. And sometimes you'll find that there are explanations. So for example, there was a case in which um, one officer had stopped a lot of Hispanic drivers in a, in a particular month or week or whatever it was, it was really noticeable and they called him in and it just happened to be that it was a, a, a group that was driving over and something had happened, but there was a, a, I've forgotten the circumstances, but there was an explanation for it and that's fine. Uh, but it, by calling officers in and, and pointing to the data, it continues to remind them that implicit bias can play a role. And be careful when you're when you're policing that bias is not what is driving your actions. And somebody else asked us about, and I'm not sure that you touched on this, but the undocumented workers in Vermont. And Vermont has maybe 1,500 people working on our dairy farms. We would not have milk without people doing this work. Uh, and increasingly with the movement of ice further and further into Vermont. So um, you can see the question here, what do you know about the undocumented workers being stopped? And yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I think it's, um, I don't have data on whether somebody's documented or undocumented uh, on their license. So I don't know about that. I think the bigger issue has been uh, when there is, um, a uh, passenger who is Hispanic and they might have stopped the driver and then they decide they're going to ask the passenger who looks Hispanic for his documents. And as I understand it, a few years ago, that was really a big issue and the attorney general issued some guidance on that to make it illegal to ask passengers uh, in those circumstances. But I I'm not really clear on those details. I, I can't say too much about that, but I do think the fact that there uh, the the issue of potentially being an undocumented driver is partly what is driving the Hispanic white disparity in Vermont. You, in a previous talk, Stephanie, you talked about the impacts by class, gender, and race of the pandemic. And I don't, I wonder if you go talk, because it feels like all of this is coming together at a similar time in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, let me just say first, the gender effects are really very clear in that women are overwhelmingly uh, part of the healthcare and social service sector and are disproportionately exposed to COVID because of the work that they're doing in healthcare. 
And uh, at the same time, schools are closed and childcare centers are closed. So they are trying to juggle these dangerous jobs with the risk of bringing the virus home in a household in which their unpaid work is exponentially increased, right? Families can't eat out anymore. Uh, well, maybe recently they can. So they're carrying a huge burden. And then you have women who are disproportionately segregated into the lowest wage service sector jobs as custodians, domestics, fast food workers, and so on and so forth. And those are public facing jobs many times. Uh, and in those cases, those workers have lost their jobs. Their wages are too low. They don't have any savings. Uh, and if they are able to go to work, they go to work with all of the health risks, including lack of health insurance that that involves because they can't afford to stay home. And if they stay home, they're destitute. So it's gendered in that way. It's raced in the sense that uh, I know people, a lot of people have talked about the sort of the um, physical vulnerabilities of people of color due to the effects of racism, right? They have higher rates of chronic diseases. They have this, what we call weathering, the, the uh, accelerated deterioration of the body because of the impact of racism on the body. There's also the fact that there, one study I saw uh, found that, um, that, that uh, African-Americans were recommended less for testing, less frequently for testing than were similarly situated white patients. And there was a story on the daily the other day about a Hispanic man, a US citizen, who went to the doctor four times with symptoms of COVID and was sent home without ever a test and ended up dying from it. So, uh, so there's two sides of that, right? Both the long-term impact of, of racism on the body, as well as the current same implicit bias that we see in policing, we see in the medical field as well. And of course, we know that disproportionately people of color, I'm sorry, low-income folks are affected by this crisis because either they can't afford to stay home uh, or if they, they do, they have so few assets and savings that they, uh, we have a huge problem of food security in this country now as a result of, of COVID. And access to healthcare too, I believe, with a real challenge, right. particularly in rural areas. Do you, Sticking with the COVID just for a minute, you wrote a column recently with Jane Nodell about how you think the government resources might be best directed at this moment. And can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. I mean, if, if the crisis disproportionately affects certain groups, then that's where the funding should be targeted. Um, people, wealthy people, People like me that have a job and a good salary, it's not affected. I don't need those resources, right? So they need to be well targeted. But I think in particular in Vermont, small and medium sized businesses, which are more likely to be um, minority owned or women owned, for example, but all small businesses, these businesses don't have the retained earnings to weather this crisis that larger firms have. And so if we don't support them, they are, they're going to go bankrupt, they're going to go out of business, and that means that those positions won't be there for people to go back through when this period of social distancing ends. Uh, the other thing that you and I talked about in that article is that um, while the state government has you know, done well in terms of responding to COVID, there is a threat of returning to kind of uh, Reaganite, Hooverite, uh, flawed economic policy of, you know, cutting the budget, which is absolutely the wrong thing to do during this period of time. There are ways to weather it economically, and we should be doing that, because if we don't, there will be much more suffering, and the recovery will be much longer than were we to step up and do what we need to do to uh, support small businesses and families right now. We are going to just take a few more questions for Stephanie. And I, I want to bring this back again to this thing that's happening all around us right now and ask you, because people want to know, in my little town of Heinsberg, there was a kids protest today of people marching in sympathy. Um, what, I mean, what are the kinds of things that you, that people could be doing at this moment, do you think, to draw, to make some of the changes that might be necessary? You know, that's, it's a really good question. Uh, and I want to, I'll just talk generally for a moment. Um, 
this requires long-term focus. It is, uh, uh, and I just read a quote by an African, um, uh, an African philosopher who said, things are moving really fast. This is the time to slow down. And in a certain sense, I think that's true that uh, there's no quick fix solutions, and we, uh, but we can begin to think about uh, what are the long-term solutions and ways that we can engage to address this. And the biggest problem with this kind of thing is that uh, when there's an event like this, people are really motivated and agitated, but after the fact that they go back to their lives, understandably, and if we don't have a sustained focus on this, things aren't going to change. So I think the first thing to do would be to look for those places of entry, if you will. Um, and a lot can happen, especially at the local level, right? If, the, if we're not involved in national politics and so forth, we have to work at the local level and the state level. And so it means looking at your community and what are the entities within your community that uh, are ways to advocate for change. So engaging your city council, uh, or your town manager. I mean, just give me an example about Vermont. When we when we did our press conference on our study in 2017, there were a few mayors that came, uh, but you know, it's the mayors and and uh, town managers that have to hold police departments accountable. If they're not, then citizens need to be calling them. They're you know calling them on this and saying, you know, you're responsible for evaluating the police chief, and this has to be a criterion. And I mean, I don't mean to suggest that it always has to be kind of a negative pressure, but we have to demonstrate that we are watching and, and you're accountable for your actions. Um, I, I just watched a video last night of the two young uh, people that were beaten up by the police and tased by the police in Atlanta, Georgia. And the press conference was really beautiful because they were invited up to speak. And what they said was, you know, thank you, that there is accountability, that police officers were fired. And they said, thank you for getting these monsters off the street and for holding the police accountable. And um, so accountability is really a lot of what people are looking for. So demand that the, the data be made public, demand that it be published once a month, not after two years without ever having looked at it. Demand that they're going to figure out how to address it and, and monitor their act. Develop a group that will be a watchdog, for example. Um, the, the, you know, another issue is for kids that are students is that there are racial disparities in discipline in schools in Vermont, just like everywhere else in the country. Uh, a number of high schools in Vermont have developed social justice groups that were responsible for flying the Black Lives Matter flag. When that happens, that generates conversations within the family and within the community that we need to be having. Silence is the enemy here. So, silence is the enemy. So finding ways to continue to raise this issue and watch what's going on and work on finding solutions. I, and I like that so much because you bring it back to what we actually can do in our in Vermont. So there's a study that shows there's racial disparities in policing. We have local police officers um, who probably in may, most cases do want to do better, but they need to hear from citizens in their communities that we care about that. Um, you know, one of the, the police chief from South Burlington was really interesting, um, Sean Burke, and uh, really thoughtful about this issue. And what he said to me is, you know, one of the biggest deficits is that most police departments don't have the funding to do kind of implicit bias training and, and or the knowledge to organize it. He said, but mostly what the police officers lack is a knowledge of racial history in the United States. Hmm. And when they are confronted with it, they begin to understand the racial dynamics that we're observing. That, you know, because, uh, you know, that because people of color are disproportionately homeless, it isn't because they're lazy. It's because of residential segregation and job discrimination and so on and so forth. And that this history of violence against African-Americans is hundreds of years old. It's not just a recent phenomenon. So, you know, I, I would ask how can communities support police departments to develop that training? They, I, I mean, they're not in a position to do it themselves, right? And I, I kind of would hope the state would step up and say, let's, you know, 
we need to take some responsibility for policing at the local, local level, provide them the resources to analyze their data, to get it back to them in a timely fashion, and to help formulate the kind of trainings that will change their mentality. But if the state doesn't do it, you can do it at the local level. You can demand that your town manager or uh, mayor and work with them. I don't mean demand, but say, you know, we as citizens, we pay for the taxes that funds these salaries. You need to represent our values. And so, you know, use town dollars to achieve those goals. I mean, that, that's, I think, one of the more fundamental things is actually the kind of racial, racial history training for police departments would be profoundly important. Well, thank you, Stephanie, for all those thoughts. And you, we can post a link to the paper that you did and um, sure. invite people to keep this conversation going and however you would like. And if you have, I'm going to turn it over to Brianna to talk about uh, where we're going next or if people have ideas for future talks for our College of Arts and Sciences Center for Research on Vermont every Wednesday at noon. So thanks again, Stephanie, and to My pleasure. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so as I said, Brianna, go ahead. And go ahead. Um, thank you everyone for watching. Um, if you have any ideas for next week or any future weeks, we don't have anyone booked for next week. Um, so we would love to hear your ideas. Um, yeah, so stay tuned for what we have coming next week. We'll make an announcement later um, this week. And yeah.